Good morning, Highland Park. We are so excited to worship with you today. If you haven't done so already, please check in using the number on the screen. And uh, don't forget your communion items. And uh, with that, let's go ahead and stand and worship together. church sing. You guys sing out, and it's so such a gift for me personally um, on just up here hearing you guys. It's, it's really beautiful. Now, this next song I know you guys will know and love. It's oldie, an oldie but a goodie. It was my grandfather's uh, favorite hymn. Someone 
You may be seated. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Of me. That scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26, is quite often spoken in preparation for communion. In this scripture, we are taught the meaning of the bread and the juice as they relate to our Lord's death on the cross. Today, however, I'd like for us to focus on the remembrance part of this scripture and what it means. The Lord Jesus told us what the bread and the juice represent and that we were to remember him whenever we celebrate communion. Sadly, I wonder if sometimes we partake of these elements without observing the remembrance part that our Lord said should accompany it. Maybe communion has become much less than it should be because we are distracted by the busyness of life, or we are becoming complacent because it's something that we do every week. My earnest prayer is that this does not apply to this body of believers. But let's bring this home to each one of us individually. When you take communion, what are you remembering? Are you remembering what it cost God and our Lord Jesus to provide your salvation? Are you remembering what the new covenant that Jesus spoke about means and how it applies to your life? What about the joy, the hope, and the peace that you have each day? Are you remembering who provided these gifts because he willingly died for you? As we share communion today, let us be sure that we are celebrating in remembrance and in obedience to what our Lord said in our scripture today. Communion packets are available in the lobby, and if you're in the overflow, they are available in the back of the room. Please feel free to get one if you have not already done so. If you are a believer in Christ, you are welcome to participate in this communion time today. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for the incredible gift that you gave us of your son, for the salvation that he provides to us because of his death and his resurrection. Father, help us to never forget what it cost you and your son to provide our salvation. Help us, Father, to always take communion in remembrance of you in remembrance of what you did for us. We praise your name, Father, and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning, Highland Park. My name is Brian. It's good to be with you. Uh, we just rolled back in from a little bit of time away, and uh, my, my oldest daughter, Sharabi, and Jason and his son, Ian, and I marched down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon and made it back out uh, after several days uh, that were just fantastic, and then got to vacation with my family uh, for a little bit away, and I managed to actually do no work for eight days, and... and um, that's, you know, it's, it's important. That's some Sabbath time. Uh, with the exception of there was this one moment, there was only one moment at the bottom of the canyon where we got cell reception, and I was turning my phone off and on to save the battery. If I wasn't taking a picture, it was off, but I turned it on one time to take a picture, and magically we got cell reception, and it, like all these text messages, um, and a couple of them were church things, and so I was like, Matt, can you please take care of all these problems? And Matt graciously said yes, so thanks, Matt, and then I turned my phone back off and never had cell reception again, so that was good. <laughs> and uh, it was cool, last week we were able to worship with you all while we were in Arizona, and we were able to pull the, the worship service up on, the, on this TV in uh, the home where we were staying, and because I want to outdo Haley, uh, I'm going to have to have Dave and Matt come both stand on my shoulders <laughs> and do what she did with her son um, last week. And I think Dave could do it because, as you know, he's now known as Spider-Man. Uh, I'm really was, uh, I'm glad Dave is better. If you did not know, Dave had a spider bite that landed him in the hospital and he is wearing a Spider-Man shirt underneath this shirt. And so maybe in the lobby, you can, you can see the Spider-Man shirt again. Uh, but it's good to be, to be back with you. Through the month of June, we're going to explore four big life lesson themes that we all need to know and take to heart. Did you hear what I said? Because I have a problem that you probably have. Sometimes people say things and I do not listen. So theme number one, life lesson number one is to listen. We want these to not only be life lessons, we want these to be things that we practice intentionally all summer and beyond. And lesson number one is learning to listen. On August 10th, many years ago, a frustrated man elbowed his way through uh, the hallways that were crowded and found his way finally elbowing into the office of the man who bore the brunt of his frustrations. The man elbowing was named Frederick Douglass. The man in the office was named Abraham Lincoln, and Douglas was angry. Douglas was angry because he had been working like crazy to uh, uh, enlist black soldiers into the Civil War effort, and, and yet these soldiers who were sacrificing the same, if not more, were not being paid as much, not being housed in similar conditions, not being treated fairly, and Douglas was gonna let Lincoln have it, and he did. But something happened in that moment, in that time, when Douglas said those things to Lincoln, Lincoln listened. And Douglas listened. And what was formed out of frustration became a lifelong friendship. It wasn't a friendship that lasted very long because Lincoln's life would not last long. But it was a friendship that actually changed minds. And I want to explore this biblical theme today of listening connected to persuasion. Those two things often go together. And we all want to persuade, right? We, we want to persuade our kids to, you know, do what we want. We want to persuade people to think like we think. We want to... All of human beings, we like to persuade people. We don't so much like to be persuaded, but we really should hope to do both. And both of those things in their healthiest form are rooted in listening. And so I want to preach from a text I preached from three or four years ago and want to do so again today because I think it, it's so important to this concept of listening and persuasion. So if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Samuel 19. Let me give you a summary context of what is happening. There's a guy named David. He is growing in reputation with military victories. He's going to be the next king. 
and he's a musician too. And that almost makes me frustrated, kind of like when, you know, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, the big muscle guy actor, and he does all these tough guy things, and then suddenly he comes out and he sings. And you're like, oh, he can sing too? I mean, he, some guys just get all the luck. And David can do all of these things, and his reputation is growing, and the king at the time is named King Saul. He starts a good king and turns into a bad king, and his, he becomes so jealous and envious of David uh, and has these, like, these rages where he even tries to kill David. He throws a spear at David trying to kill him. Can you imagine trying to play the violin and having somebody throwing a spear at you? I would be a little off key at that point. But David has eluded his death threats a few times, and he realizes that Saul is coming after him, and he, he meets up with his best friend, Jonathan, twist to the story happens to be Saul's son. I mean, it's complicated. It's dramatic. And that's where we come to chapter 20. And I want to begin reading. David now fled from Nioth to Ramah and found Jonathan. What have I done? He exclaimed. What is my crime? How have I offended your father that he is so determined to kill me? That's not true, Jonathan protested. You're not going to die. He always tells me everything he's going to do, even the little things. I know my father would not hide something like this from me. It just isn't so. Then David took an oath before Jonathan and said, Your father knows perfectly well about our friendships. So he has said to himself, I won't tell Jonathan. Why should I hurt him? But I swear to you that I am only a step away from death. I swear it by the Lord and by your own soul. Tell me what I can do to help you, Jonathan exclaimed. When David says, your dad is trying to kill me, Jonathan at first dismisses him. This is an example of not listening at all. He says, it's not true. It isn't so. My dad's not trying to kill you. You're just overreacting. It can't really be that bad. It was impossible in that moment for Jonathan to believe that his dad could be conspiring against his best friend. Never mind the times that Jonathan already knew his dad was capable of such things. Never mind the fact that he knew David to be a man of integrity, his best friend he trusted. And yet when he hears those words from David, something is discombobulated in him and he refuses to listen at first. See, when we say it isn't so, we flatly reject both the problem and the person. And it's easy to say it isn't so when you're not the one having spears thrown at you. But when you're the one dodging spears, you realize maybe it is so. Our, our tendency is to defend our family, our friends, our tribe, or our traditions, or what we've thought, if we naturally dismiss the words of trustworthy people when it conflicts with our own loyalties or experiences, that's kind of the it isn't so mentality. It isn't so equals get over it. You're exaggerating. I will not be persuaded. I will not listen to you. And how many times have we dismissed someone saying that they were being harmed or mistreated or in danger, and we said, it isn't so, it's not all that bad. Because my school gave me opportunities when, my, when I was little, I'm sure you've had the same educational opportunities. Because my family had opportunities or safety and security, I'm sure your family has had those same things. My beef with Jonathan is that he failed not only to listen to someone in distress, he, lists, he, he failed to listen to his best friend who is in distress. That should tell us something about the human inclination to not want to listen to tough news. We would rather just, you know, I, I've told you before that I don't, I don't play golf a ton, but when I do and I hit a bad shot, my everything within me, and it happens about half the time, is to not watch the golf ball. I'll get up and slice some driver that's going 200 yards the wrong way, and my first thought is just to look away, look down, thump the ground, whatever. And when is the time that you most need to watch the golf ball? 
when it's not straight down the fairway. Kevin hits a few of those. But when I hit it, it goes sideways, and I should be watching where it goes. And I don't want to, we don't want to look at our own failure. We don't want to see the bad news. And this is what Jonathan does to David. But thankfully, we read on, we read the rest of the paragraph, and Jonathan does what few did. He changed his mind. He, he listened to David. David kind of takes another run at it. It's kind of like, okay, you dismissed me the first time. Let me try this again. And he, he explains it again, and he's passionate about it. And this time, Jonathan listens. And I appreciate that about Jonathan. You know, if, if you have never changed your mind about one debatable issue your entire life, it might not be that you've been 100% right your entire life. <laughs> I appreciate that Jonathan changed his mind about an important topic, about something. Doesn't mean that we always should, but sometimes that means that we're just listening. So do you know what is way, 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 way better than saying it isn't so? It's saying it might be so. Let me hear you more. Let me listen more. Tell me more about that. I'm listening. Oh, for us to have that response. It doesn't mean that we have to say, oh, I believe everything that you're telling me, but it means that we say, I respect you enough as a human being to listen a little bit more. Tell me more about that. Talk to me. Explain this to me. Help me understand. I'm listening. Jonathan does that, and it salvages the friendship. Barry Corey, the, the president at Biola University, speaks of approaching a public life, the public square, with a firm center and soft edges. The, the firm center is your moral core. I will not compromise on these things. But there's a lot of things that how I approach people can be with a real softness. And I think that softness is often listening. I'm not going to change my mind that I love God. I'm not going to change my mind about his truth. But I, I will gladly listen to you talk. Explain yourself. Tell me more about you. Walter Brueggemann wrote that the prophets offered, uh, quote, an alternative perception of reality to the ones that people had, had adopted as their own. A, a, a view of reality that allows people to see their own history in the light of God's freedom and his will for justice. Because people had, had thought, this is how things are. This is the way I do things. And the prophets we see in the Old Testament come in and say, wait, 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 we want to disrupt all of this. Because here's what God says about how you're living. Here's how God sees the world. Here's how God sees humanity. Here's where you have it out of line. Will you listen to God? Frederick Douglass tried to do the same thing in his long struggle against slavery. He saw it as an elaborate system, racial oppression, um, and he even used the words, you're offering a flawed perception of reality, a poisonous account of who we are as humans. And he pled with Christians who, because of many people, uh, had places of authority and were in the dominant position, he would go and plead with them and say, would you please rethink your perception of reality? Would you let God define how he sees people? And part of what he did was warn against when you look at people with brutality or indifference, it not only wounds them, but it corrupts your own soul. And that was one of the things he talked about a lot. But he would ask, are you listening? Will you listen to people? Will you listen to those who are wounded? We, we listen not because we want to persuade somebody. That can't be the first and primary and only goal of listening. That's a dehumanizing. However, when we listen to people, we suddenly have opportunities to persuade and to be persuaded. And both are good things. The, the Christian needs to be persuadable and able to persuade both things, right? We want we want God's truth to always be persuading us. 
We want other Christians and maybe people who aren't even believers have something to say to us that can persuade us, that can help us, that can be good for us. We want to be people who can be persuaded, but we also want to be people who can persuade others because we have answers the world needs. We have many broken people around us. We want to be able to persuade them. Listening is not the primary. We don't, we don't just listen hoping to like jump in as soon as we can. We listen because we care for people because we wanna have the characteristics of God who is a listener. Jesus persuaded people. Persuading people is a good thing. Think about this, he met Nicodemus late at night on his terms. You know, Jesus could have said, if you wanna meet with me, you meet with me uh, in the middle of the day in the town square so everybody can see. He's like, okay, I'll meet you all sneaky-like in the middle of the night. I'll meet you on your terms. And he does, and he listens, and he attempts to persuade. He sat with the Samaritan woman at the well, and he listens, and she listens, and he persuades. Paul was in in the work of persuading people. In Acts chapter 14, it says, he won the crowd over. That's persuasion. In Acts 17, it says, some of the Jews who listened were persuaded. See, listening persuaded, and joined Paul and Silas along with many God-fearing Greek men and quite a few prominent women. Acts 19 says, but as you've seen and heard, this man Paul has persuaded many people that handmade gods aren't really gods at all. Acts 26 says, Agrippa, he was a king, interrupted him. Do you think you can persuade me to become a Christian so quickly? Paul tried. Because we understand our responsibility to the Lord, we work hard to persuade people, and we are open to God persuading us and people persuading us. We become all things to all people. That involves listening and persuading. We answer with gentleness and respect in order to persuade. Only God saves. I can't save anybody. You can't save anybody. But we can persuade We can be partnered with God and his spirit and the works of people to persuade them to say yes to Jesus, to come into his good grace. One of the things our family did that was really fun this last week was we we did a kayak tour. So we had a tour guide that led us on this little kayak adventure into this canyon. And uh, by the way, uh, halfway through the trip, my daughter... um, said to me, Dad, you're going to be using lots of Grand Canyon illustrations, aren't you? And I said, you're not wrong. Um, so buckle up. Uh, here's one of them. Um, uh, our tour guide for this little uh, uh, kayak tour that had my family, and including my youngest, 13, and my parents in their young 70s, um, his name was Zach. And when I called, they said, tell us about your trip. And so I had a chance to explain, here's our family situation. Here's what we're thinking about. Um, we heard that on Memorial Day, there's lots of boat traffic. And I don't know that I want to be in kayak amidst lots of speedboats going by. And they're like, we hear you. Here's what we suggest. We can do Tuesday. We can do really early in the morning or Wednesday, really early in the morning before the wind kicks up, before the boats get out. And we can go here. And it's not quite as far as here. And then we got there. And, you know, Zach, our tour guide, was excellent. He showed us here's how you hold the paddle correctly. Here's where you want to go. We noticed he always could see all of us. He would always be in position where he could see everybody, even around rocks. He was really funny and he had lots of information. He told us lots of little fun facts about things. But you know why I was thinking why we really like Zach? Because he actually just spent lots of time listening to us. He would ask questions. So tell me about Tulsa. What, what, what is there to do there? What do you guys like to do there? Tell me, uh, have you gone on hikes before? Tell me about this. And I realized that he got to know everyone's name in our group immediately, and he asked every single person lots of questions and listened, and that's why we liked him. And I think we would have done what he said anyway, but it was really easy to do what he said because he listened. He was able to persuade because he was a good listener. And as Christians... We should never try to persuade people whom we have not listened well to. I had told you several weeks ago, one of my heroes, uh, Timothy Keller, passed away several uh, weeks ago, uh, was a preacher. I listened to countless of his sermons. 
And one of the things I love about Keller was he moved to New York. He was not native to New York City, but he moved there and planted a church there. And he did not go to New York trying to just immediately persuade everyone and tell everybody, uh, hey, y'all have all these problems. Let me tell you all the answers. He went with this attitude of listening. And it was, it was from Keller I got the idea years ago that about once a month, I'll go over to Barnes & Noble and I'll look through the magazine section um, and I'll pick out a few magazines that I don't want to pay the money to subscribe to all of them because that's a lot of money. But I'll pick out a few magazines that maybe don't share my worldview, um, but maybe tell me something about culture. And I'll sit down and I'll just kind of thumb through them and, I'll, and sometimes I'll find an article. You've heard me quote psychology today a few times. It's a big magazine, and sometimes there's some little nuggets of stuff of like, oh, this is how the world is thinking about this issue. Maybe there's something to learn. Keller did this all the time. He was always reading so that he could learn to understand the people of New York. And as he learned to understand them and listen to them, he could realize, I understand better your brokenness here or your need here. Let me tell you how the gospel can interact with your life. Let me tell you about God's grace in your life. And you think that your problem is this, but actually your problem is something way deeper than that. Let me address this and tell you how the scripture, and that was the foundation to his whole ministry. He listened well. And as Christians, we should always have this attitude that's not combative with other people not combative with our culture, not this woe is me, everyone's against us. I don't see that in Jesus or in Paul's writing. I don't see that in, in the pr great preachers of our day. What I see is a, a diagnosis, a listening, an empathy of you have lots of problems and God is the answer to all of those things and he will walk with you and help you so we listen so that we can persuade then later. So a question then comes up. If you try to persuade somebody of something and they don't listen to you at all, what do you do? I mean, we have this happen in personal relationships and in big relationships and in all kinds of things. If somebody says it isn't so, then what should you do? Can I just list three things I see from the text? Three things that we can do. It's David's response. Number one, if at all possible, stay in the relationship. Stay in the relationships that the Lord has given you. Try to do that. The person might come around. The person may have overreacted. The person might have reacted about something that even has nothing to do with you. But in some way, if you can, stay in that relationship. Because the way that we encourage and influence other people is by being in relationship with them, right? So if you can stay in that relationship, stay there. David physically stayed right next to Jonathan. He didn't just immediately run off and go away and say, forget you. He stayed there in the relationship. Number two, speak courageously and persistently. Even though he stayed, he said, hey, listen, this is so important to me. I'm going to try to tell you again. And he said, your dad's trying to kill me. <laughs> Please. My days are numbered. And so he speaks. He's courageous and persistent while he stays. Number three, speak gently. There's a way to speak courageously and persistently, but still gently. He doesn't call Jonathan a bunch of names. He doesn't say, hey, you blockhead, what is wrong with you? But he says, Jonathan, listen to me. He does all of these things. And I just think this template for us is good in our relationships. Stay in that relationship but speak the truth, let people understand what's going on, and do so as gently as you can, because when we speak gently, we invite people to listen to us. Proverbs 25, 15 says, patience can persuade a prince, and soft speech can break bones. In other words, gentle speaking can move mountains right? We want to persuade people. We speak with gentleness. Proverbs 25, 15 says patience, uh, that patience can persuade a, a prince and you can persuade people. And that's listening and that's being gentle. The danger of an academic, and dare I say, even somebody who's super knowledgeable about the Bible and how to defend the Bible, 
Those are good things. And I want you to do all of those things and learn those things. But there is a danger that you could get to the point where you only care about winning an argument and not winning a person. And we're in the business of winning people. And so we need to treat them as people. We listen with gentleness and persuade. May the words of Lincoln be true in your heart with malice toward none and charity for all. That was in his second inaugural address. It's about a you know, weeks or maybe a month before he was shot and killed. With malice toward none and charity for all. For the people who were trying to kill us, no malice. With the people we fought against, no malice. Let us come together as one. That was his heart. See, Lincoln, if you study his life, moved from being primarily concerned about salvaging the country, the Union, to in his later years, being concerned about people too, especially former slaves. He had been persuaded by Douglas of what he was trying to do, what he was trying to accomplish. So after that second inaugural address, I think maybe the finest speech in our country's history, you should go read it, uh, there was a, a party, a celebration there at the, uh, the White House and all these people coming and going and um, these people in there, these dignitaries, everyone wants to get seen with Lincoln. And Douglas walked in and somebody halted him. said, I'm not sure your kind can be in here. Something along those lines. Lincoln saw all of this unfolding from across the room. He was tall. He could see across. And he said loudly, Mr. Douglas, there's the man I want to see, loud enough for everybody in the room to hear. And he said, there's no one else here whose opinion I value more than yours. What do you think? And Douglas said, it was a sacred moment, a sacred effort. Good job. They spoke to one another there. Like David and Jonathan, I think Douglas and Lincoln were able to stay in the relationship speak courageously and persistently back and forth to each other and speak with a gentle enough tone that they could stay in that relationship. This summer, we want to ask you to think about how can you better listen? You know, in summer, everything's disrupted. Schedules are disrupted. School is disrupted. You know, all kinds of things. People traveling more often. Um, just everything's a little bit different for the next two and a half or so months. Everything's a little bit different. But can I encourage you to listen to people, especially to people that maybe you're having a difficult time with? Listen to them. And I want to just ask you, would you bow your heads for a few moments and let there be a few moments between just you and God right now? And I want to just guide you in a few prayers. And then I want you to pray them, and I want you to listen to God's Spirit because we believe when we speak, God listens, and when, we, and, and when we listen, God speaks back. So would you just listen for a few moments? The first prayer is, God, how can I listen to a family member this week? The second prayer, God, how can I listen to a neighbor this week? Third prayer, Lord, how can I listen to someone in this church family this week? Fourth prayer, Lord, how can I listen? I mean, really listen to someone with whom I work or play or watch kids' activities or see in a walk or one of those people I casually see and maybe have never really listened to. How can I listen to them this week? The 
next prayer is, Lord, in my listening, would you help that relationship heal, bloom, grow? And if I need to be persuaded, would you let me be? If they need to be persuaded, would you work in their hearts to prepare that? Would your work on earth be done through this listening posture? Amen. Let this be a listening summer. In doing so, it will be easier to be slow to speak. It'll be easier to be slow to anger. And best yet, when we take a posture of listening, it's not that you hear from me or the person next to you. You, you do all of that. But when we take a posture of listening, we hear from God. So let's let this be a summer of listening to God. You know, we're pretty unique here. We have this faith that, that says God loved us and created us and cares so much for us that he listens to us. Even in our foolishness, he hears us. Even in, even in the things that we complain about, he wants to listen to you. And in our best moments, we are quiet and we listen back. For the next few moments, uh, we're gonna sing a few songs. And if maybe you have not been listening to God, and thus probably listening to others, and you wanna just ask for prayer about that, I would love to pray with you here at the front. And, and maybe uh, you just need to sit quietly while we sing and say, God, I'm listening to whatever you wanna say to me right now. I'm gonna, I know I've not been listening for a while, but I'm listening right now. I wanna encourage you to do that. If you're worshiping online, we, we wanna encourage you to just pause where you are too. Would you listen? to what the Lord is saying to you. He speaks to us, so let's listen. God, we, um, we invite you to speak. We're ready to listen. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand up with us?
may be seated. Each Sunday we have an opportunity uh, to give, and uh, this morning if you would like to do so, don't feel pressure if you're a guest, but uh, this is part of our worship time, and it's an important part of our worship time. If you would like to give today, there's a blue box in the back, uh, uh, walking out of here or walking out of the overflow, or you can give online safely and securely. In all of our years of online giving, we have not had any kind of issues uh, with that, and so we encourage you uh, to be part of that every time that we give. Um, we give uh, not... For us, but we give and we say, Lord, we trust you with this money to do better with it than we could do on our own. And so we want to ask the Lord uh, to bless what is given today and to supply the needs of the church, okay? Lord, we thank you for your goodness and, and your love. And uh, Lord, we, we pray that for uh, everyone giving to support the ministry of Highland Park here both locally and uh, which helps us care for people, young and old alike, and in our neighborhood and beyond and even around the world. Uh, we pray for uh, our, our mission teams uh, all over the world that today you would give them peace and joy, uh, that they would be encouraged in their work, and that we could be part of that encouragement to them. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we're really excited today. We have high schoolers headed to camp this afternoon, so that's really exciting. And so be praying for our high schoolers uh, this week. And then next week, our junior high students uh, head out to camp. And so I just want to ask uh, the church for us to be praying for them. And, and I wanted to just close today by praying for our students who will be going uh, to camp. And, uh, and if you are a guest here at Highland Park, would love for you to stop by Connecting Point. It's right on your way out here. You'll see it if you walk out the main doors and to your right and have some folks that would be glad to visit with you and meet you, have a gift for you there. And so would you just stand and join me and, and we'll pray for our students and the other students that will all be at camp uh, uh, this summer. Lord, we know that through the years, there's a lot of people here who had their life um, changed or the trajectory of their life changed uh, through what you did during a week of camp. And uh, we pray for that sort of significant life change in the hearts of our students and all of the students from other, other churches who will be gathered at Sunset Bible Camp this week. Lord, we pray that they would come with a listening posture to hear from you and to one another. Uh, Lord, we pray um, for our uh, sponsors who will be there and again from other churches that you would give them health and energy and wisdom and love and patience and all of those things as they care for and shepherd our students. And we thank you for the camp. We pray for its leadership and we're thankful for how it served you for so many decades. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You're dismissed.